In the movie Memento, no spoilers if you haven't seen it, the main character has a form of memory loss that he acquired after an incident prior to the start of the movie. He still has his memories from before the incident, but can't lay down new long-term memories. He only has the now window of time, when things are active in his mind. He's also developed coping strategies to assist in remembering things beyond now, but let's not get derailed in the first minute. The thing I'd like you to keep in mind from this is the character's now. Just, he's got a window of time that he can think in and live in and make decisions in, and it's sort of moving in time with him, but hanging on to older information is next to impossible for him at this point. And this type of memory impairment isn't fiction. And there is a silver lining here that's little consolation for the people who actually have these impairments, but a lot of what we know about neuroscience is from people sustaining different types of brain damage and seeing what functionality is preserved and which is impacted. And certainly that's the case with memory. We know from different types of brain damage and different types of functionality preservation that we seem to have different memory stores for long-term information and sort of working what's floating around in our head information. You with me? Cool. Time to distract you with the opening credits. This video made possible thanks to the continuing support of viewers, patrons, and PayPal pals like you. Thanks! Hi! Welcome back to the channel. This was originally going to be a patron topic pick video, but in typical me fashion, I wanted to build enough of a foundation on a concept related to the topic that it's its own video. That's It's this. I want to have a foundation on working memory before getting to that poll winner, so we will get there, just not today. We're going to be covering a little bit of history on working memory, or as it used to be and is sometimes still known as short-term memory, before getting into one of the big models of working memory today. Shall we? We shall. Someone I very briefly mentioned in my Cognitive Revolution video as contributing evidence that helped lead to the birth of cognitive psychology was George Miller. In 1956, he published the wonderfully named The Magical Number 7 Plus or Minus 2, Some Limits on Our Capacity for Processing Information. This was written in the days when psych papers could still be more conversational in tone. The take-home message from this paper was that people have a limited ability to hold information active in their head, specifically about seven chunks of information at any given point in time, with a chunk being a unit of memory. Let me explain. If I give you a random string of numbers or letters to remember, you'll probably be able to remember around seven of them. Let's say I give you D, T, W, A, T, L, S, F, O. But if you're able to group those random items into something more meaningful, your apparent capacity will grow. This is because you will be putting those random items into a chunk. In the biz, we call this chunking. So you could try to make a word of it. De twaddles foe. Or you could recognize that there are airport codes and break the nine item string into three airport chunks. Detroit, Atlanta, San Francisco. You can almost think of chunking like a computer compressing a file. Some sort of algorithm or heuristic is used to compress that information down into something that's easier to manage. Then, when you need the raw information back out again, you'd have to unchunk that file to get at the raw bits. One powerful demonstration of chunking is seen in chess. Kind of. So in this particular experiment, they compared players of various skill levels, novice all the way up to expert, and their ability to recall the configuration of chess pieces on the board. So some of the arrangements of the chess pieces was just random, you know, just putting them wherever, especially if it doesn't make sense for the game. Other configurations were taken from what you might see in those learned chess playbooks, where this configuration was seen in this game and these were the plays that came out of it, sort of thing. This is a distilled representation of some of their findings. The horizontal axis has the arrangement condition, with random piece placement on the left and placements you may see in an actual game on the right. The vertical axis shows the average number of pieces correctly recalled by the participants. Finally, participants have been categorized as novice or expert based on their ELO ratings. So, when the arrangement was random, everyone was able to get around four pieces correct. But when the arrangement of pieces was in line with actual chess games, 
there is a drastic difference in ability to replicate the arrangement, with experts now able to recall 12-ish more pieces than novices. Side comment while I've got this plot up. This is a lovely statistical interaction. One group's score doesn't change between conditions, while the other group's does. Very persuasive. Much evidence. Wow. So the expert chess players were able to do something that the novices couldn't. And if this was a classroom, I would ask you guys what that thing is to see if you were paying attention and are awake. But I can't do that on YouTube yet. So that thing is chunking. The experts are able to efficiently chunk. If you aren't familiar with the big leagues of chess, a lot of it comes down to having extensive encyclopedic knowledge of how previous games have went. It's like you have to know the different configurations of where the pieces are and the best counter moves to make against those to win. Someone at the novice to intermediate level is probably going to be trying to anticipate what their opponent is trying to do. Are they trying to lay a trap to get the queen? Are they just zerg rushing for the king? Like, what's their game plan? But at the expert level, it's much more abstract. It's almost a form of pattern recognition. This configuration of these pieces on the board means that the best move for me to make is to move this guy here. Rinse, repeat. This is why chess has been an easier problem for AI than vision. Being able to compute the outcomes from possible moves and going with the one most likely to lead to victory is right up Code's alley. The expert chess players can recognize these piece configurations and the number of chunks it takes to represent the arrangement drops drastically. Said another way, more chess pieces can fit into a given chunk for the experts. This is reflected by the marked increase in ability to recall the piece configuration. Besides incredibly obviously wrong arrangements, like having both white bishops on white squares, the random is mostly indistinguishable from the typical configurations for non-experts, which is supported by the lack of a difference between arrangement types for the novice players. Miller's magical number 7, plus or minus 2, has seen some refinements. So if you're able to strip away all of the strategies and heuristics and other cheaty things that we do to try to maximize the stuff we're holding in our mind, it's thought that a more pure estimate of our working memory capacity is four items plus or minus one. Something that got a bit more attention in my Cognitive Revolution video was the atkinson schifrin information processing model of memory. This was the model of memory that was sort of like how a computer processes info. Kinda. Information goes in through sensory memory, is passed to short-term memory before being potentially processed for long-term storage. Things can also be pulled back out of long-term memory to be processed again in short-term memory. In this model, the part relevant for this video is the short-term memory store. This is a part of their memory model where you are actively using the information, and the authors put the lifetime of info in that part of memory at about 30 seconds unless you did something more with it. Going back to the memento example from earlier, the main character needed to actively refresh the info he was working with in a scene, otherwise it would just slip out of mind. Of course, this can happen to people without memory deficits too. You're talking with someone, having a great conversation, and something pops to mind. It would be rude to interrupt with it now, so you'll talk about it later. You're sure you won't forget, it was such a cool thought. And later comes, and apparently you weren't doing enough maintenance processes to keep it in mind, and just poof, there it went. Speaking of, Atkinson and Schifrin also proposed that we use controlled processes to use and improve our memory. In general, in cognitive, when we talk about controlled whatever, we're meaning that it's something the person is intentionally doing. The other option is automatic processes, where it's something that happens without the person's intent. Some of these control processes would be things like the maintenance or rehearsal processes to keep things active in short-term memory, ways to search through short-term memory to pull out the information you need, and ways to get that information from short-term memory into long-term storage. Chunking is a controlled process. While this model was fruitful, it did have its problems. And because we're talking about working memory today, we're going to focus on the criticism relevant to short-term memory. There was evidence suggesting that different types of information were handled differently, not that everything was just sort of tossed into the same short-term storage box and processed in roughly an equivalent manner. Also, the idea of short-term storage needed to be reframed. It wasn't that the information was just getting dumped into the short-term storage and hanging out, it was being worked with, hence working memory. 
Before getting into the meat of this model, I want to point out that while it's a big dog on the block, it's not the only research pup out there. There's other models for how working memory works, and they're definitely interesting, but for today we're going to focus on the big dog Baddeley. We'll start here with an example of one of the fun tasks that make up this line of research. I'll have a mock-up running of this while I talk, but you are tasked with remembering a string of random numbers up to eight digits long. In addition to this memory task, you are also asked to make a true or false judgment about the presentation of two letters. So you might see A, B, then be given the statement A follows B, which should be responded to with false. After you make this judgment, you recall back the number string. Rinse, repeat a bunch of times with different string lengths. If we only had one multi-purpose short-term storage bin, the judgment task would eat into the four plus or minus one storage slots and we would see a performance decrement on the number recall task. But people were able to do these two tasks with low error rates across the board. So we're able to multitask like this when the two tasks don't really load on the same type of working memory. More on that in a sec. When they start loading on the same form of working memory, that's when we see the error rates increase. The current conceptualization of working memory is that there are separate subsystems that handle different types of information. There's a phonological loop for sound stuff, the visuospatial sketchpad for visual stuff, the central executive is like the boss in charge of working memory, and the episodic buffer helps bind info together for long-term storage. For each subsystem, we'll go through an experiment demonstrating the functionality. The phonological loop basically handles speech and other sounds. This part is thought to have two subsystems the phonological store, and the articulatory loop. Sound information coming in will hang out for a little bit in the phonological store. If nothing further is done with that info, it'll pass out of mind. But that information can be rehearsed and refreshed in the articulatory loop, so it'll stay in mind longer. This part of working memory is also active when you are subvocalizing. So when you're reading something to yourself and not reading it out loud, you're subvocalizing. Experiment time! Since the phonological loop works with sounds, especially for language, it's susceptible to acoustic confusion. One early demonstration of this had participants learning letter lists. The letters were presented on a screen and serially, so one at a time. One list contained letters whose names sounded similar, so like C and V kind of sound the same. The other list contained dissimilar sounding letters, so like C and W sound completely different. They found higher recall of the dissimilar sounding letters, which is highly suggestive of how we handle written language. This seems to indicate that we translate the written stuff into an internal acoustic representation. If we weren't running the sounds in our head, there shouldn't be a difference in recall rates between the two lists. This effect has also been demonstrated for similar and dissimilar sounding words. Although there has been some debate about whether the confusion happens in getting the information in to working memory, or if it's after the information's in and you're doing the rehearsal processes. The visuospatial sketchpad is used for both visual information as well as spatial relationships between things. Interestingly, similar to how the phonological loop translates visual representations of language into auditory code, the visuospatial sketchpad can store a visual representation of something from a verbal description. Also, think back to the demo a couple minutes ago. People are able to do the learn number list task at the same time as the spatial judgment task because these two tasks are loading on the different working memory subsystems. If these tasks were changed so that they were loading on the same system, performance would drop. One use of the visuospatial sketchpad is in mental imagery. The classic experiment here involved rotating Tetris looking objects in your mind. In this experiment, participants were shown pairs of these blocky objects and asked if they matched or not. In order to answer this, participants had to mentally rotate the object to see if it matched. The critical manipulation here was the degree of rotation the two shapes were off. Intriguingly, participants took longer to respond for objects the more they were rotated. These plots have the rotation angle along the horizontal axis and the average response time for the same pairs along the vertical, so we're not looking at the dissimilar pairs here. This suggests that the extra time was needed for the larger differences because participants were having to mentally rotate the figure in their head to see if it matched. Note for a future video. There's a whole debate about how this information is actually represented in the brain. If it's stored sort of in analog, as described previously, or if it's stored in some abstracted brain code. The central executive has lots of jobs. 
It integrates information from the other subsystems of working memory. It's also important in directing attention and cognitive strategies. Additionally, it's also used when inhibiting undesired responses or suppressing irrelevant information. While the phonological loop and visuospatial sketchpad appear to have their own storage systems, the central executive does not. It's more of a coordinator and director than a component actually doing the work. However, it does appear to have a capacity limit. It can only do so much. A demonstration of this can be accomplished through the incorporation of daydreaming. So the primary task in this experiment was to generate random numbers at the rate of about one per second. Participants were given instructions that these numbers shouldn't fall into any discernible pattern and that any number, the likelihood that it's followed by another number should be roughly equal for all possible numbers. So it just, they need to be random. And they had to do this task for 30 minutes. Although they did get sort of breaks roughly every two minutes where they would be interrupted in their number generation and be asked what they're actually thinking about and how aware they are of the numbers that they're generating. When participants were engaged in the task and not letting their mind drift, the generated numbers were more random than when they were daydreaming during a hard but otherwise boring task. This suggests that daydreaming or other tasks not tied to the sensory input are demanding of the central executive enough that you can't do other tasks. You can kind of think of this like the old school screensavers, like the flying toasters, being intensive enough to do that it tied up the computer's processing. The episodic buffer is the new-ish component on the working memory block. This subsystem is a multi-purpose store for information from the other subsystems, plus things pulled up from long-term memory. So this would be the part where information from the different modalities would be integrated into a cohesive whole. As such, it's dependent on the central executive for being told what to do. This also allows for previously stored memories to be reprocessed, possibly incorporating new information into that memory. Think back to the memento example from earlier. The real world version of this amnesia is part of the impetus for adding this subsystem. In experiments, people with this type of amnesia are able to hang on to stories or tasks for a period of time, like the character in Memento, but eventually it will fade. The episodic buffer is a part of working memory that allows for the juggling of this integrated information, just with this type of amnesia, it can't be encoded into long-term memory. The biggest way to apply this to your life is to be mindful of what you're doing and know your limits. If you're doing something language related, like writing an essay or a report, choose your background noise wisely. In grad school, I did most of my writing to music, things ranging from like Tool to Dead Mouse to Columba Christ, depending on my mood. And now when I'm writing the scripts for these, I can't listen to anything really. No music, not even like chill step and I'm not sure what changed, but I have a harder time filtering out the speech and the noise, and it's just easier if I'm not listening to anything. And that's a plus here. If you take the time and pay attention to yourself, you can figure out what you need pretty easily. Maybe you can listen to a podcast and write at the same time. Maybe you're not really doing both of those tasks at optimum efficiency. In any case, you can intuit what you need pretty easily. If you're doing something heavy on the visual or spatial aspects, you can probably squeeze in music or other background noise pretty easily. But if you start loading other visual tasks onto this, then you'll probably start seeing those performance hits again. Wrapping up a lot of these things is driving. It is a demanding task, and it's important to not forget that you're driving a potential multi-ton murder machine. Your central executive is busy managing everything, your visuospatial sketchpad is busy representing the world around you and your path. The phonological loop is a little busy with road signs and speed, possibly some music or conversation. Busy, busy, busy. So adding a cell phone to the mix, even hands-free, is adding at least one more ball to keep in the air. I know from experience that asking people to not use their cell phones while driving is not going to happen. So instead, a compromise. When you're driving, your number one task is to drive playing with the Spotify playlist, phone conversations, navigational assistance, all of those are secondary. And if you need to futz with your phone for some reason, do not do it while the vehicle is in motion, please. And maybe I'm preaching to the choir at this point, 
but five to ten years ago, I'd have students debating me about how much of a hazard they weren't because they needed to text while driving and they were fine. Trust them. Even though we could throw them in a driving simulator and show that they were running over kids. Besides the point. And this is especially more relevant now with all the live streaming that people seem inclined to do while they're driving. Be safe ducks, not dead ducks. So yeah, there's your crash course on working memory. There are a ton of follow-ups and rabbit holes to explore on this topic, so if this was interesting, subscribe. And patrons are aware of what the first follow-up will be, so if you would like to be in the loop on that or vote on future topics, hit up my Patreon. You can also find me on Twitter or on my Discord server. Links for everything are in the description box. And yeah, see you guys in the next video. Bye!